Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today I'm going to talk about the dihydroxylation of alkenes using osmium tetroxide, as well as the cleavage of those diols using periodate. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems that I assigned last lecture. So in this first problem, we take this alkene and we treat it with ozone, followed by dimethyl sulfide. That's going to give us a different product than if we treat this with MCPBA. So in the first case, we undergo the ozonolysis reaction, which affords this keto aldehyde. And the reason that we have stereochemistry on these two centers is because we had previously had stereochemistry on this um, sp3 bond outside of this ring. This five-membered ring, which is bicyclic previously, now is only the five-membered ring without the second uh, cycle because it's been cleaved open using ozone. Now in the next case, if we use MCPBA, this is an electron-rich olefin, which is very easily epoxidized using MCPBA, which is why we get this epoxide. And because the benzene is this big bulky group, we tend to get epoxidation on the top face of this cyclohexane. And so if you try building this molecule with a model kit, you'll see why epoxidation happens from the top face rather than from the bottom face most of the time. Now in the next problem, we take this dialkene containing substrate. And in one set of conditions, we're going to get the epoxide on the left. However, in another set of conditions, we're going to get a cleavage of a double bond. So in the first case, because this is an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl, this is an electron deficient alkene, so we need to use some sort of reagent such as sodium hypochlorite or hydrogen peroxide. And so when this occurs, hydrogen peroxide adds to the beta position, and through back attack of the enolate at the second oxygen of peroxide, we form this epoxide. Now in the next case, we just have another ozonolysis reaction, and because this isn't a conjugated double bond, it's more electron rich and it makes it easier for ozone to react. If you left this reaction long enough, you might also start cleaving the second double bond with ozone, but this double bond here should react more quickly, forming this ketoaldehyde shown here. Now with that, let's get to today's material, the dihydroxylation of alkenes and subsequent pridate cleavage. So, this reagent, osmium tetroxide, is often used for the dihydroxylation of alkenes shown here. This is also known as upjohn dihydroxylation. It has some significant advantages over ozonolysis when combined with pariodate. One advantage is that osmium tetroxide is catalytic, usually you will see only 1% catalyst loading, and then an additional oxidant is used to reoxidize the osmium back to osmium 8. So usually this is N-methylmorpholine oxide, which is commonly abbreviated to NMO. What this reaction does is it converts alkenes to 1,2-syn diols. So uh, if you wanted an anti-diol, you'd have to use different chemistry to prepare them, as osmium can only add to one face of the alkene. So you're always going to end up with your alcohols on the same side. Now, if you had a rigid alkene with different geometry, you could get different alcohols. But in the case of something like this, we're going to have two alcohols resulting like this. If you'd had a trans-alkene, you might be able to get the opposite. Uh, product. Now it's worth noting that even though this is drawn as a single enantiomer here, because osmium tetroxide on its own could either add to the top or the bottom face of this alkene, we're actually going to get a racemic mixture here. However, you can add additives in to make this enantioselective. So there is a reagent which is called AD mix beta, which is a combination of osmium tetroxide with syncone alkaloids which we talked about in a much earlier episode about non-carbon chirality. If you're interested about that, I'll put a card here that you can click on. And essentially what that does is it allows bias for the uh, dihydroxylation to occur on one face versus the other. And there is two different, there's two different reagents you can use, one which is derived from quinine, one which is derived from quinidine. And because they have slightly different stereochemistry, they're not quite enantiomers, they're diastereomers you can often get selectivity for one face versus the other face if you needed to try this on your substrate. So it's very useful to know about AD mix beta. So while we mainly talk about alkenes being dihydroxylated, alkynes may also react forming 1,2-diketones, and sometimes you'll also get cleavage of the alkyne forming carboxylic acids. In this reference here, it outlines what various different alkynes do when treated with osmium tetroxide. However, there still isn't very many examples in the literature compared to that of alkenes. If you'd like a full review of reactions that occur with osmium tetroxide, there's a really great reference here from the Encyclopedia of Reagents for Organic Synthesis, E. E. Ross. Uh, I also want to highlight that this transformation is one that's worth remembering as it's one of the most reliable reactions in organic synthesis. If you have a double bond 
and you treat it with osmium tetroxide, it will almost certainly be dihydroxylated. And when you have reactions that are this reliable, it's important to pay attention to them because they're they're like a hammer and a nail. You know you can hammer a nail into almost anything if you hit the nail hard enough. So the mechanism of this reaction is first, it's a three plus two cycloaddition, where this is one, two, and this is one, two, three. When this adds in, we form this five-membered ring, and this is able to be hydrolyzed, forming this diol. Uh, the osmium-8 is reduced to osmium-6, and through a subsequent step where osmium-6 reacts with N-methylmorpholine oxide, or whatever oxidant that you're using in your case, it is converted back into osmium-8, as well as N-methylmorpholine, through the loss of water. Now, one interesting example of this is the treatment of this uh, dihydrofuran-containing sulfonate, which is converted to this dihydroxy product. Now, in their case, they actually use this uh, obscure sulfonate as a leaving group, and they subsequently substitute this with lithium bromide, and this is an uncommon leaving group. Um, however, this was used in a total synthesis, and if you're interested in that total synthesis, I'd encourage you to look at this uh, paper here. In this next case, we have this, this uh, alkene, and it's an alpha-beta unsaturated alkene. Uh, it's an alpha-beta unsaturated ester, rather, so this is a Michael acceptor. It's an electron-deficient alkene, and because this is electron-deficient, this reacts much slower. So in the first case, you can see that it only took 12 hours for this dihydroxylation reaction, whereas for this electron-deficient alkene, it took 144 hours, so 12 times longer. But they also obtained the product in similar yields. Now, one really useful thing that you can do is pyridate cleavage. So this is a really popular reaction because this works most of the time. Occasionally you have other side reactions, but if you can prepare a 1,2-diol, which can be syn or anti, and you treat it with sodium pyridate, this will be converted to two aldehydes or ketones, depending on if these alcohols are further substituted. If you start with tertiary alcohols, you'll get ketones. However, if you start with secondary alcohols, as is shown here, you're going to get aldehydes. You can also have like a terminal one that you don't care about that you just cleave off to make something like acetone, for instance. Now, the main disadvantage is that if you wanted to use this chemistry, you have to use osmium tetroxide if you're starting from an alkene. And osmium tetroxide is toxic and it's quite volatile. However, there's uh, other compounds such as AD mix beta, which is the one of the chiral versions, which is already immobilized uh, to the ligand, the synchona, synchonoid alkaloids. Um, however, you could also use something like potassium osmate, which is a salt, and it's a little bit easier to handle. Um, and since we're using these usually in about 1% catalyst loading, this will just get converted to an osmium-8 species in situ with your oxidant. If you'd like a review on all of the different reactions of sodium pridate, here's a link to the Electronic Encyclopedia of Reagents for Organic Synthesis, EROS, which outlines most of the major advances using sodium pridate. It can do other reactions, but for the most part, it tends to be fairly well behaved. If you wanted to do the same transformation with different conditions, you could do something such as Kriege oxidation, which uses lead tetraacetate. But since we typically try to avoid heavy metals, lead is also not too good. Um, you could also use something like potassium permanganate, but as we know, potassium permanganate is a sledgehammer and it can do a lot of other reactions. Finally, it's worth noting that you can use periotic acid and this works quite well also. So the mechanism of this reaction looks somewhat similar to the osmium tetroxide mechanism, except we already have our alcohols installed. So these two hydroxy groups will attack the iodate one at a time, uh, and then they can undergo a, this concerted mechanism where we cleave this carbon-carbon single bond and we reduce the iodide from an iodate, which is an iodine-7 species, to an iodine-5 species. And this will produce two equivalents of aldehydes in our case because we started off with secondary alcohols. Now this iodine, this iodine 5 byproduct is something we don't care about. Um, this is just a byproduct. So sometimes certain iodides that are hypervalent will um, like convert to higher and lower valence uh, iodine species, but in most cases an excess of uh, pyridate is used because it's a cheap reagent. Now some examples of the use of pyridate cleavage are such as these. So here we have this complex tricyclic compound with protecting groups and esters, and you can see that this is cleanly converted to the aldehyde as well as acetone, which isn't shown. But you can see that this is a tertiary alcohol, and so since we cleave this carbon-carbon single bond, this will just be converted to acetone. You can see that this is quite a fast reaction occurring with water at room temperature in only an hour and 15 minutes. So this is quite a nice appealing mecha mechanism and method to use for synthesis. 
Another example is in this derivative of a nucleotide type compound or a nucleoside rather. Here we can see that we cleave this tetrahydrofuran ring into a linear system where two aldehydes have been formed while still retaining the stereochemistry of this nitrogen containing heterocycle in only 20 minutes. So this is quite a mild procedure that tolerates the presence of complex functional groups. Now, if you wanted to combine the osmium tetroxide chemistry with sodium pridate all in one pot, this would be called the Lemieux-Johnson oxidation. And so in this case, the first step would be the osmium tetroxide dihydroxylates the alkene, followed by the cleavage with pyridate, affording an aldehyde. The other aldehyde in this case would be formaldehyde, but that's not shown. It could also be that the formaldehyde continues to oxidize, continue to, oxidize to CO2 and water. Um, but this is useful because it's all done in one pot. You also don't need to use N-methylmorpholine N-oxide because sodium pyridate is a good oxidant, and you would just use an additional equivalent of this to oxidize the osmium back up to osmium-8. And so here you can see another example where we have this complex furan-containing compound, and we're able to dihydroxylate that alkene and undergo uh, subsequent oxidative cleavage, affording this aldehyde. Now in this case, they used 2,6-dimethylpyridine as a base, likely just to uh, prevent side reactions where this protecting group, which is called an acetonide, might have been falling off. So these can be acid sensitive, and so perhaps if in the presence of water, this might have been forming some priotic acid which cleaved this. And so one trick is if sometimes these reactions produce stuff you don't want, add a mild base, such as 2,6-dimethylpyridine. Um, these are both relatively fast reactions, as both transformations are occurring together in under three hours, which is quite good, especially given that these high conversions are obtained. So for this lecture, I would like to assign two practice problems. In the first one, I'd like you to show what would occur if you treated this reagent with first MCPBA, then you treat the same starting material with ozonolysis, and finally, what would form if you treated this with osmium tetroxide. The next problem I'd like to assign is taking this alpha beta unsaturated ketone with this alkene on it, propose a series of steps that would afford this carboxylic acid containing epoxide. And so there isn't just one solution available for this. In the next lecture, I'll propose what I think is a good uh, sequence, but you might be able to come up with an even better one. And so this is our first real practice problem of a multi-step synthesis. And so it's really important to learn, once you know uh, like, and understand all these different reactions, can you propose a series of them to get from one complex molecule to another? These are still relatively small molecules, but the more of these you know, the more cool compounds you can make. And multi-step synthesis is frequently on final exams and midterms due to the importance of understanding them as a concept in organic chemistry. And so with that, I hope this has been a useful reaction and I hope that I, uh, a useful reaction video, and I hope that I could convince you that this sequence is preferable over ozonolysis in most cases, as long as you don't mind working with a little bit of osmium. If you have any questions or comments about this, I'd appreciate it if you leave them below. If you want, you can give the video a like and subscribe or share it with a friend. Have a great day.